That's good. It's working. Hello, everyone, on this another crazy Monday, right? Hello, welcome to the Institute for the Future. I'm Marina Gorbis. I'm executive director of the Institute, and it's a such a privilege and a ple pleasure to welcome Doug Rushkov here. I consider Doug a personal friend, a colleague, a peer. He's a fellow at the Institute for the Future, somebody who I've known for a number of years now. And as probably all of you know, Doug is a media theorist. He's a professor of media studies. He's a prolific writer and provocateur and really amazing thinker about everything. Um, and I just finished reading his book, Team Human. I highly recommend it. And that's what Doug is going to share with us. He's going to talk for a little bit, and then we're going to bring, we're uh, hosting this event in collaboration with Shareable and Neil, Neil Gornflow is here. So we're going to bring him here and be in conversation with Doug. Um, this is part of our series called For Future Reference. It's a series where we host academics, researchers, interesting people, innovators, activists, who share their work that we feel is future focused and forward looking. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with the Institute, we're a 50 year old research organization, nonprofit, dedicated to helping people systematically think about the future because we think it helps us make better decisions today. So welcome, Doug. Thanks. Well, first, thanks so much for coming. I'm honored. On a, on a solo level, if I'm allowed to say that. Um, and that's almost the thing I want to uh, engage with you all about tonight. So I'm, I'm thinking, I know this is the beginning of my, of my book tour thing, but because it's here, I want to think of it as the end of it. Um, so I can actually accomplish something uh, and, and work, on, work on the stuff that, uh, that I'm working on. Um, this, the interesting thing about this book and the reception of this book that I'm still kind of reeling from is usually with my books, kind of half the reviews agree with what I've said and half the reviews disagree with what I've said. And that's just fine, right? So I'll argue Judaism is an open source religion. Some people go, oh, isn't it a great? Judaism is an open source religion. And other people say, no, Judaism is closed and it should always be closed. God damn it. Um, all right, fine, fine, fine. All right, you disagree. You disagree. You know, I say, oh, you know, Google is extracting money. You know, it's not distributing money well. It's just like, what are you, anti-capitalist, horrible person? Or someone will say, oh, right, you're right. You know, the companies are hurting us all. Um, with this book, the, the difference in the positive and negative reviews is less that they agree or disagree, but that some people think this book is a negative, hopeless, sad, pessimistic book, and other people think it's a hopeful, spirited, rallying cry, optimistic, almost Pollyannish view. And that's interesting. And I realize the, the reason why the people who see it as a negative book see it as negative is because the things that I'm saying in the book that I consider as they read. But I'm talking about phenomena that are so unfamiliar to many people now that they seem not to exist. And that's interesting. So they read it and they must see it, but it's just like, Oh, right. So then he said, oh, but if we all actually rally together and form solidarity, we could, yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah, right, right, yeah. As if that's just an aside. Whereas what I'm talking about is, no, if we find one another and forge solidarity and unite ourselves as a species, there's great things that we could, but it's like, woo, it's like no one in there. And that's, that's interesting to me. That's, that's the thing that, what I'm realizing that I may need to do 
even as a, a rather agnostic Aristotle's notion of the soul. Or, as Mr. Rogers would put it, you're okay just the way you are. You are special just the way you are. Now, I was raised watching Mr. Rogers. Thank God for that. And I did not have, I didn't, I'm, I'm not talking about being a cuddled, uh, late baby boom in mind, being told that I'm great or getting a medal for losing in soccer. It's not that. I'm not talking about getting a trophy for losing at soccer. I'm saying that I got the message early on from Mr. Rogers that I came in with value and dignity, that just the fact that I arrived here as a human being is worthy of not applause, but, but the, an acknowledgement of dignity, that there is essential human dignity. And saying that there's no kind of essential human dignity is fighting words in so many different arenas right now. From BS reductionist, Renaissance era Francis Bacon, Rapo Science. You want to read your Francis Bacon? I mean, basically, this whole understanding of science was we're going to, you know, Nature is this woman. We're gonna get her, you know, down into submission and take her by the hair. And I mean, my God, that image he had of what it meant to do science. That, or the capitalist notion of human beings as just uh, a fodder from which to extract value, or as we see it now, the digital realm's understanding of human beings as a medium to be played. Uh, this is the reversal that I watched in my lifetime that kind of broke my heart, was here came these technologies that would have given, could have given, still can give human beings unprecedented uh, capabilities if we could use these technologies to express our intentions. But instead, we've actually gotten to the place where we build technologies that use us. Right? Every time you use your smartphone, your smartphone gets smarter about you and you get dumber about it. And even if you wanted to get smart about it, you can't because its algorithms are locked up in proprietary black boxes that you're not allowed to see. So we have this technological infrastructure that's busy trying to figure out how to play us, how to either extract money from us, extract data from us, extract time from us, using, you know, go to BJ Fogg's, you know, laboratory at Stanford right now, how to use Captology, how to use Pavlovian responses, how to use Freudian uh, techniques, how to use stuff you don't even know. Just tell the algorithm to get something and it will figure out how to do it by any means necessary and we'll never even know what it is. So Facebook's algorithms find out, oh, if you show someone a picture of their ex having fun, they're going to click on it relentlessly. <laughs> We can now figure out, oh, I can see why someone would do that, but it's the ex having fun, not the ex not having fun. So they're just A-B testing reality for us so fast, but they're playing us. Our technologies are playing us. And I'm no longer thinking about this digitally. What I'm thinking is that these digital technologies are expressing a much, 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 much older set of understandings about human beings. And I think the real problem is that we look at hu human beings in terms of our utility value. What value can we create for the market? What are the inputs and outputs? How much work can we get done? These are basically industrial age understandings of what human beings are. Or uh, uh, Egyptian empire pharaoh understandings of what human beings are. They are labor, they are pyramid builders. And if we understand human beings in terms of their utility value, then of course we're going to use people. So I'm coming along and saying, well, wait a minute. There's this other dignity in humans. There's something else. But this is where I got the team human name from. It was I was on a, a panel with a, a singularitan who shall remain nameless. And he was arguing on the panel that computers are about to hit the singularity, at which point their complexity will be greater than ours. And since the story of evolution is information striving for greater and greater 
uh, uh, more and more complex homes for itself, that those human beings are no longer the most complex home for information, information will move on to computers. And the human beings will only be valuable insofar as we keep the lights on for the computers, and after they don't need us to keep the lights on, we should recede into the background and totally accept our extinction. And I said, no, human beings are special. Right? They, and the best arguments I could come up with at the time were human beings can embrace paradox. We like ambivalence. But we don't have to resolve everything into a one or a zero. We can stay in that weird little in-between place, that alive, unknown, unresolved world space. And that's cool. That's strange. Unlike computers, human beings can watch a David Lynch movie and not understand it and experience that as awe. <laughs> you know, we can, we can experience things without spoilers. We don't, we don't need endings. We, we can keep it open somehow. You know, and the best of all of us can keep it open longer and longer and longer and stay in that state of, of awe. And that is special. That's worth keeping around. And he said, oh, Rushkoff, you're just saying that because you're human. As if it was hubris for me to argue for the humans. And I said, fine, guilty as charged. I'm on team human. And that's where I got the team human meme. Team human. But the thing I realized about the team human meme is, do you know how we get to experience that dignity, that awe, that little weird place? It's together. That's how it happens. It happens dynamically between people when you establish rapport. When you could talk about it, you know, uh, biochemically, you look into someone's eyes and their pupils get wide and my pupils get wide and you micro motion your head and it's getting a little redder up here now, mine's getting red and we're mirroring each other's breath and the mirror neurons are firing in my head, the oxytocin's going, you love me, you know what I mean? But you felt it, right? I mean, you could, you could, you could talk. Levels too, right? There's other there's other forms of resonance, whether it's scientifically verified resonance or the bad EBGB stuff. But if you're searching for human dignity alone at the computer, you're never going to find it. And so the way that we the way that we uh, uh, I'm not even going to say manufacture, but let's let's say it the way that we that we conjure the way that we conjure human dignity is in groups together by conspiring. Literally, conspire, breathe together. This is why we were just talking about nothing sacred before. This is why the rabbis were so upset when they were going to take the oral Torah and write it down. I mean, they needed to write it down because they were going thrown into exile. But if we write it down, then Torah is no longer a gathering of people breathing together and speaking. They're not only not going to remember the story, they're not going to be the story... The story until now, the story is something that has to be spoken aloud between people for it to exist, and it's bonding. So they made a rule where you're not going to be allowed to open the Torah unless there's 10 people gathered. They had this rule, a minion. Don't worry, it'll be fine. But at each step along the way, whenever we develop an idiom, we have to remember each new idiom is a drug. It's a drug. And we know digital technology is a drug. We know that, right? It's created as a drug. Television is a drug. It has a different effect. Television makes television's globalist. It makes you think of the world as one big place. Television was the medium that let Ronald Reagan say, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Television's what let us watch the moon landing together and the Olympics all together. Radio was a different medium. This is all McClellan, but radio was fiery, passion. It was great for, for Hitler, for for FDR, for Winston Churchill. It created something else. It was great for Rwanda. You know, it, it rips people up. Text was a dangerous medium because it disconnected people. Now you could communicate without actually being there. Now you could just lie on a piece of paper here. Text let you predict into the future. It let you write about the past. It, it, we wrote contracts for the first time. I mean, it changed a lot. That's why we had uh, why we developed the law and, and, and the sort of the Judeo-Christian ethical traditions, because we had text. And we knew we're abstracting our culture here. We're going to have credit and debit and ownership, and it's going to be different. When you go to a monastery and you run into a monk, and the monk's not talking for 30 days. 
Are they going at silence fast, whatever? Why are they doing that? It's not we only, I used to think, oh, it's always because of ego, right? Oh, because now he's not going to talk because he's going to uh, be humble. No, it's because they know language is also a drug. I'm on English now. I'm on English. I've got subjects and predicates and objects and verbs. I think about things in this English way. If I don't have a name for it, it doesn't exist. English. So what do they do? 30 days. I'm going to go off English. And what do you get when you go off English? You get the opportunity to touch, is there some essential something? And I'm starting to feel like I should almost come out of the closet and say, I believe there's something else. I'm not saying it's theistic in some way. I'm not saying I believe in God. I'm saying I believe in soul. Now, in the soul and soul, why is soul always oppressed? Why are people with soul always thrown in jail? Or copied at the mall, you know, and turned into something else? Because I do believe that there is a that consciousness or soul, or whatever you want to say, pre-exists. Is, 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 is a precursor to matter, not an emergent property of matter. And if you go there, then you, you, you retrieve some essential human dignity. And even if it's not true, I like it as a premise. I like it as an argument. I like it as a way of justifying uh, uh, ethical uh, engagement with, with technology and with the world. Right now, the most ethical people around, or at least a famous ethical people in technology are part of the, what's called the humane technology movement. Humane technology. What does that mean, humane technology? It's, to me, it sounds like cage-free chickens. We're gonna be humane to them all the way to the slaughter. Let's make humane technologies that treat the people in their care more humanely. That's the wrong, I don't want to be treated humanely by my technology. I want to treat my technology humanely, but it's the wrong way. It's the wrong way. The human beings have become the ground instead of the figure. And it's okay to think of in terms of nature that way if you want to, but you're part of nature. I mean, we are. We're both part of nature and we're nature's stewards. We're the conscious actors in nature. We can, if we so choose, try to make nature less cruel. Human beings can make the world less cruel. We can make the world better than we found it if we chose to. But because we have so little um, respect and love uh, and, and uh, uh, understanding of, of essential human dignity, we have trouble distinguishing ourselves from zombies. That's what all of our science fiction is about. The robots are better than us. The zombies are no worse than us. They're friggin' zombies. They're not conscious. They don't, what do zombies can't they do? They don't talk to each other. They don't work together. They're all individual. They're all in their individual programs. They don't know how to be a team. And here I am going around the country trying to argue for the continuation of the human species. Saying, hey, not only can we do it, but we should do it. Come on, humans. Let's create a place for ourselves. We don't all have to die. Isn't that weird? Yeah. And then, yeah, and then, I mean, then, so, and then I say that, and then you get a review in the New York, in the Wall Street Journal or something, say, this guy's crazy. It's crazy. That people have some worth, some value. So it's, it's like, not just that it's crazy, it's like, these are fighting words. That's, you know, what brings down capitalism in the end? It's human dignity. That's the world. That's what does it. That's what brings land and labor back to the table, along with capital, is a little bit of human dignity. So, yeah, so that's what I'm experimenting with now, is that. And to see whether or not there are ways to 
talk about there being something essential, there being a formal cause to humanity, as Aristotle would put it, or not just an efficient cause, not a final cause, not a material cause, but a formal cause for humans. And I would think that has to be soul. I mean, and you can go, I mean, I can talk to quantum people, right? There's the quantum field, it pre you know, if, if, and if human beings help resolve quantum states into, into particular ones, there's, you know, science ways. We could talk to Lee Smolin, has some great uh, uh, books about, about time preceding matter, matter rather than matter before time, and he kind of is an anti big boom, uh, uh, big boom guy. There's ways to play it. But most importantly, I think what we have to do is, is re center. Right, in, in our humanity rather than in our businesses. We have to look at, and this is everywhere, everywhere. Look at, your, look at the classrooms that your kids are in. The principals of our high schools are talking to the CEOs of companies to find out, how can I create better workers for your company? They forgot that education was not an extension of work. Education was originally meant as compensation for work, for the coal miner who was spending all day in the mines should be able to come home at night and read a novel and understand it, or read the newspaper and participate meaningfully in, in representative democracy. And now we've turned it, it's just an externalized cost of corporations onto the public sector. And then what happens? Then you've got kids learning skills from iPads and not learning how to be collaborative or cooperative or to form a pure in the room. That serves corporations well because you can do it in your cube and you won't know how to talk to anybody. There'll be no revolution. There'll be no rapport. There'll be no solidarity. But I've been teaching, I've been teaching in the university. This is going to be my fifth year. Each year on the first day of class, I'm getting more notes from kids who have a note from the doctor saying that they are excused from presenting to the class. I'm not saying they're being coddled or that they can't do it. Or kids who are in a seminar, in a graduate class, graduate seminar, I'm not going to be able to really contribute around the table because I have an anxiety about that. You know, they can't make eye contact. They can't be with other people. That's a strange thing to be breeding. I can understand it from a power perspective why we would do it. You know, but it's the same reason there's no chat function on Uber for the drivers to talk to each other about how they're feeling about their jobs. Right? <laughs> it's not the assembly line, and you can't just talk to, you know, Joe on the left and Lucy on the right. But I'm actually, I mean, this all sounds dark, but I'm actually hopeful because everywhere I go, I mean, you all basically agree with me. I mean, you all feel like there's something going on. You feel alive. You feel conscious. You remember what it's like to have will and drive and intention. I mean, and frankly, most people do. Most people do. And, and, and uh, uh, reformation of this society, I believe, is, and I know this is not uh, uh, immediately talking about structural changes, but, but I think it's as easy as people engaging with one another in real life. If you're engaged with people in real life, then when the tweet of the Covington kid with the MAGA hat staring at the Native American comes through, you're not going to be compelled to make a comment about this scene that you have no idea what the fuck is going on there. No of my friends and educated PhD people had their comment about this horrible MAGA kid, and when you pull back and find out, oh, well, actually it wasn't that, and then you pull back again, oh, it wasn't that either. And it doesn't matter what it was, you weren't there. You weren't there. That's what we have journalists for. They can go and find out what happened and they'll tell you. Now, but we are just as bad as anybody if we are using the Jerry Springer Twitter feed in our phone as some indication of what's going on. But this is not a tricorder. And you're not on an alien planet. Right? We have the home field advantage here. Are the natives. Even white privileged men now are indigenous to the planet. <laughs> so I have, I have, you know, I have hope. Yeah, I have structural ideas, things we can change about tax codes and, and all that and the way we run computer companies. And, but um, I think most important right now is just, is this, is establishing rapport, is being together with other people, being able to tolerate looking into someone else's eyes. 
when I talk in a high school or a college, I'm saying, I'm giving them the challenge is try to spend 10 minutes a week with another person to start. 10 minutes without the TV on, without no chance of cell phone, no chance of smartphone. When you watch them sweat with the 10, no chance just to be looking in the person's eye. If you can, look in the person's eyes and actually be with them. But if you can, it's okay. Play cards. Have sex. There's things you can do that take the whole 10 minutes. <laughs> right, but not sex like that, right? You know, you know, you can't hold the no selfie during it. But, uh, but it does, it, it starts something. And then we start looking. People start looking for other ways. How else can I be with people? Where can I be with people? Where can I be? Oh, no, look at that loud music playing. That's not music. That's just noise. What is it for? Oh, I don't want to be here. I can't be with a person with that stuff. So now we got to find another space and another space. And then slowly but surely, you know, you start retweaking reality to, uh, you start optimizing reality for human connection, right? Rather than optimizing human beings for digital extraction. And that's, uh, uh, I think that that will happen. I think that happens at scale, right? Humans live the world at this scale. This is our scale. You can't live at scale. And corporations live at scale. We live here again, home field, this scale. But shoot, man, we got all the corporations, all the banks, they all took the internet from us. Let them have it. Let them have it. And we, get, we got Terra Firma again. We got the real world. You know, it's always like this booby trap. They all went online. Good. This is where they live. You know, let's take back, let's take back the planet and see. That's probably enough of a, of a launch from me. I could, I could use, use some, some feedback. So, of Marina Gorbis of Institute for the Future, Neil Garnflow of Shareable, I mean, which are, which are basically, you can't have one without the other. Um, you, don't, you don't get the future without the sharing. It's sort of the, why it's such a nice partnership to have here. Who has the incentive and how of developing technologies that maximize for the human? And how do these, how does this work that they're not, there's gravitational pull for developing other kinds of technologies that are using humans and is using them as products and all the, but who and how do you develop those technologies? Do you feel like we need to basically change the Facebooks and Twitters of the world? And, or is that an impossible dream? Do we develop other technologies? Do we disconnect from these technologies? What's your view? How do you join Team Human? I mean, I think that, that what Mark Zuckerberg does understand is that his apparent monopoly is so indefensible. It's so, I mean, I feel like there's probably three different people in this room that could build a Facebook clone and throw it on even Amazon Cloud, so Bezos gets money, fine, whatever. Um, throw it on Amazon Cloud for now, or, or what's the other one? Um, uh, which one? Azure, I mean, there's probably a less evil one, right? Um, uh, you know, Stack Space or whatever them, one of them. Um, Box, I don't know. Um, I don't know this industry. Um, but. I'm thinking you can clone these things way more easily than you could back when Facebook was built. But these are not, this is not rocket science. You know, so, so we could do that. This, the, the young people who are starting technology companies and see um, what happened and the, the agony that a Mark Zuckerberg actually is living, understand that, oh, if I just take less money at a lower valuation, I can retain control of my company. I won't have to pivot this from a social media company to a do evil to humans company. Um, and that's more fun. I think, and I've, I've spoken with the billionaires and a few of them, not a lot of them, a few of them who aren't, who's, who's get back to the Bible. I mean, whose hearts haven't been so hardened that they can't um, function anymore. Um, they're open to the idea that it is less efficient for them to try to earn enough money to insulate themselves from the world they're creating by earning money in that way than it would be simply to try to make the world a place they don't need to insulate themselves from. You know, it's hard to do it after the fact. So when Zuckerberg says, now I'm going to give back 99% of the money I need, that should be a 
a hint that, oh, if you hadn't, if you hadn't made that extra 99%, you might not have had to create this awful dehumanizing platform to begin with. But I think the, the, even the wealthy um, would like to be on the better side of this thing. It's a matter of, of uh, and this is for me, it's how do I lessen their fear? So kill human is not, fuck the rich, let's get them, storm the Bastille, you know? That makes them afraid. We don't want them to be afraid. We don't, because then they're just going to get more defensive. What we want them, what we want to do is, is kill the humanity in them and have them realize, oh, right, these other people, these are people I'd like to having fun with, rather than having them all hate me. You know, they need to see, especially if they're operating at scale, they need to see their, their companies like family businesses again. And the people who run family businesses, they don't fuck over their employees because their kids go to school with the employees' kids. They live in the same town with the employees. So as they start to realize they live in the same world with the people that they're affecting, they can think, oh, what if I try to affect them in a way that makes them like me instead of hate me? I mean, it's, I mean, maybe that's BS it's for you. It's so optimistic. It's, great. <laughs> it's not optimism. It's like, it's like, do we believe that they're human? And if they're human, then I believe they still have souls in there somewhere, that they can still have their ethical, uh, li they're alive, right? The act of aliveness is positive. The act of being alive is a positive thing. That can be a uh, uh, that could be triggered. I guess what I'm kind of, and Neil, jump in, but I guess what I'm saying is that it's not just about them. I don't see these people as evil or bad. It's that we are created institutional structures in which actually we're all contributing to this. Right. Right. We don't know what, when we're right. tweeting and doing this, the, there's a larger institutional framework that's making us basically behave inhumanly not inhumanely inhumanly right but but the the funny thing is and i've talked about this before is that these developers who see themselves as so disruptive are actually reactionary right what they've done is figured out really from from the moment wired magazine was launched onwards how do we stop this model 2000 psychedelic people's rebellion and they figured it out, right, through digital capitalism. It's reactionary. This is not disruptive at all. Nothing's been disrupted. You come up with a new technology, you go to the old man at Goldman Sachs and say, Daddy, how do I make a billion dollars? Welcome, welcome to the machine. I mean, Pink Floyd wrote about this for rock and roll, but now it's happening writ large with, with, with digital companies. So you're right, they are then building their technologies on top of an unacknowledged operating system. They, they're not disrupting growth-based corporate capitalism. That's the accepted circumstance. That's accepted as if it's nature. So then we build digital on top of that, and then build platforms on top of that, and then build jobs on top of that, and universities on top of that, and nobody's challenging the underlying uh, 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 structure until we do. So the easy way to the, the easy way to fix that on a policy level. I mean, if if I could talk to Bernie or something, or if you could run for press. If I could run it, would be the easiest, easiest flip of the switch fix is flip the capital gains tax with dividends tax. So easy. Right now, we we'll punish dividends, we punish earnings, and we we'll reward capital gains. So that's why Jack Welch found out, I make less money making a washing machine and selling it to someone than I do lending money to that person to buy the washing machine. So everybody who wants to make money gets out of actual production, out of services, out of goods, and into financialization. But only the sucker actually provides a good or service for someone else. And so, but it feels better to actually create a, a good or service for someone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and uh, yeah, it's like your take what you said, Marina, about what are the structural changes go one step deeper, right? Which is, because I believe that, that values and, and culture, everything flows downstream from that. And so my question is, is like, what are those team human values and what are not the team human values? I mean, 
humans have all sorts of values. I mean, the two values that we sort of need now are the ones that got repressed in the last renaissance. Right? The way that I've structured this moment in, in the book is I say this is not a revolution, but it's a renaissance. A renaissance is an opportunity to rebirth old values in a new context. Renaissance, rebirth. So the values that you rebirth are the ones that got repressed in the last renaissance. So in the last renaissance was, was most simply, the last renaissance was the, the intentional repression of the peer-to-peer -peer local market society of late medievalism. People were getting wealthy. That's how we had the bourgeois, the burghers. They, were, they had local currencies, market monies, and they had peer-to-peer -peer transaction. So we got the, the corporation and central currency, which were both law that was being used to repress the rise of the middle class. Now, instead of using law, we're using code to really try to accomplish the same thing. But what should we have uh, uh, emerge or get retrieved in this renaissance? Again, Wall Street Journal isn't trying to go back to medievalism. I'm not. I'm trying to retrieve medieval values and rebirth them in a new context. Very different. That's how you move forward is you, you move your right foot and then that left foot that's back there, then that one comes forward. Then that one comes forward. Doesn't mean you're going backwards. The foot's back there, but it goes forward. So I, I got to explain to, to Wall Street Journal how that works. <laughs> and, but, but the values that we've got to retrieve are those, and we'll see it in, in craft beers and Etsy and 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 Burning Man and Occupy. We see the people actually, you know, making the money to create value. That's why I talk about when we when we talk about what's my economic solution. I talk about anarcho syndicalism, which is a it's it's a network of lots of little cottage industries. So, uh, and we see it, a platform cooperativism, worker-owned co-ops, credit unions, uh, public banks. I feel like we're seeing it. It's just not on the radar because I mean, it has nothing to do with Trump memes, or, but, but it happens in red states and blue states. It's mutual aid. It's, it's the, the, the emergence of a social contract based in human beings providing one another with, the need, with their needs. You know, and that's just, it's a, it's a, it's, that's why I feel like the reason why this might work, unlike a revolution, it's like this secret society of a majority of human beings that are, you know, living the shareable ethos. Yeah, exactly, yeah. But it's interesting, just those examples, right? You take Etsy, you take Burning Man, both got co-opted in many ways, right? So it's really hard to stay human and th with those principles, when you're living in this larger operating system that has all the incentives to basically make you inhuman, and it's hard. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing that happened to the acid tests in the 60s and the barns, you know? The guys find out, the, 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 the asshole guys find out, hey, there's some girls on acid in a barn, you know? And they're with the 60s. You know, Jerry Garcia said the 60s was like two weeks, 1968. <laughs> <laughs> And I understand. I don't know where to sure. But, you know, and I talked about this at the DisinfoCon in 1999. The fact that Google people are trying to come to Burning Man and do it is actually a good sign, not a bad sign. They want to be cool. They want to talk. They want to be human. They, they, they want that. They just don't quite know. And I think what we have to do, rather than saying, oh, fuck you, Google, you're not allowed in our party. Is, is, is figure out how to onboard them. They love that word. Figure out how to onboard them to the human race. I don't know if you saw this. It's probably a meme, but it's on Twitter. Uh, at Davos, there's like just two signs. One sign says, oh, here's a VR experience. Uh, feel what it's like to be a refugee. And the other signs, here's a line for private limos to go take you. And it's a perfect example of what happens in, in these kind of settings, right? Burning Man and Google people going there and then going about right. or whoever. I'm right, but they also have to, we have to help them understand these experiences in terms of something other than utility value. Right, so am I going to Burning Man for self-cure? You know, and that's the big app. What do they call these apps now? These uh, wellness apps? Wellness. I'm meditating for wellness. And look, I have a chart that shows my brain state is better after I've meditated. I've gone to theta. I did that. Oh, what great utility value. 
what great you've done, but I'm happy for you. You know, it's, it's wellness is not, there's no wellness quotient, right? Again, it goes back to some essential well of, 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 uh, that, that you can touch. It's very, it's very, it's different. You know, it's not, it's not applied humanity. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that leads me to ask Douglas. I mean, one of the, one of the reasons why I started shareable is, you know, first I love people, right? Um, and, and, uh, I just so enjoyed, got so much pleasure from seeing people collaborate and being successful at collaborating, being successful at working together, right? And creating things uh, that were beautiful and useful and, um, and that just resonated so deeply to me. You know, it's like, what, you know, I would read these, I just never get tired of these stories. And they're the kind of thing that really touched me that like, uh, that, you know, I, I'll cry. I'm like, oh my God, that's so beautiful. I just love that. I want more of that in the world. How do you get, you know, how do you, you know, kind of catalyze or spark that kind of love of other, love of people working together and being successful, successful together? Well, I mean, first, you, you tell a different evolution story in school. I was taught that the big trees competed with the little trees for sunlight. And if you were a little tree, you got shaded and then you'd wither and die because the big tree got the sun. I read The Secret Life of Trees and I found out that's not the case at all. The big trees share nutrients with the little trees through a network of mycelia under the, in the soil, which turns out is not dirt, but a living thing all of its own, to the little trees. And then when the big trees lose their leaves, the little trees, which are evergreens, they give nutrients to the big trees in the winter. It's a collaborative act. And then look at, read, I mean, if you really want to know about evolution, you read this Darwin guy who wrote about it at the beginning, and it turns out he's not writing about the survival of the fittest individual. He's writing about the survival of the most collaborative species or species that can collaborate with one another, and you get a totally different story of what's happened. So I would argue that shareable businesses actually will beat non-shareable businesses if, right, if we can get some of the artificial laws restricting shareability stricken. And the easiest way to do that is from the bottom up, the smallest companies. And then, and, and if you are a small company- yeah, through in, cities. Right, right, through cities. And again, Renaissance, what did the Renaissance do? It went, was a transition from the city state to the nation state. The city state, an organic amalgamation of people that grew up sort of naturally to the nation state, an artificial boundary put around people with a myth of origin so they would believe it. And so if we are going to retrieve what got repressed in the last Renaissance, we retrieve the city. And what do you see when, when Trump or America says there's no climate change? You see cities saying there is climate change and we're going to do something about it. You see cities able to legislate against uh, uh, whatever Walmart kind of company they don't want in there or Uber operating or Airbnb running their housing market. So uh, again, I mean, in people in cities, the form, you know, whether they're forming Winco or Publix or uh, 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 Ace Hardware, I mean, there you can you can win, so to speak. I hate even the word win. You can thrive. You can thrive even in a highly competitive landscape if you have a cohort of people that you're sharing with. There are mics. Uh, Julie has my test test. Uh, I was, you mentioned about people working together, but one of the things, like you go to Athens, it's the space or the city or the space itself. And I was, our spaces have become kind of um, without textures, kind of monolithic, where there is no opportunity for people. Like you go to Greece or Berlin, you sit outside, people are sitting in the street for no reason having a coffee. And you look into a people's eyes, you talk to Joe Random and something comes out of it. You sit in Palo Alto with the most interesting people around you with the highest density. And everybody is not talking to each other. <laughs> right, because these, these towns were built around the automobile. And, they were about, and, and American towns were built intentionally so that people would require automobiles to get from home uh, to work. It was, you know, clever GMness. Um, so what do you do about that? It's hard. You know, Levittown was built intentionally to prevent men from congregating. You know, it was a, a psychological experiment. I mean, and look what it did. It alienated us. I mean, does it mean we can't meet? No, it just means that the landscape in which we're trying to meet is biased against those little, those little circles. 
But yeah. you know, that's a great project for someone to do, right? So yeah, I mean, it's, it's not just the technology that's creating division, it's just the way our spatial, our, our society is organized spatially also. Right. You know, we have weird zoning laws, for, for instance, you know, that separate the functions of the city and then also separate classes and races through like things like single family zoning. Right, and now we're gonna redo the, redo the landscape again in order to increase the reach envelope of the robots. Right, or close to a Google bus stop. Yeah, <laughs> or close to the Apple Fortress. Um, there were a couple of things. When I first heard the title of this, it made me think of what Ben Franklin said, which was, which is, I'm paraphrasing here, we must all hang together or we will all surely hang apart. Um, I'm not sure if that's the exact quote, but right, I, I was like, yes, team human, that's it, we must work together. And the other thing, there was something you said earlier about how the notion of human dignity and human rights are fighting words. And I'm thinking to myself, because of my background's in law and ethics, how did we get here when right after World War II, we all got together after World War II of, from the lessons of the 1900s and the Great Depression and World War I and World War II, we came up with this beautiful document, the UN Declaration of Human Rights. And nobody's talking about that except maybe in the classroom. <laughs> and it's like we've forgotten all the lessons that we've learned. And so I'm so glad to, I'm so glad you're doing this. <laughs> right. I mean, and, what, and the lesson that we're getting instead is the same lesson that the monarchs used to get us to do the Crusades or to get, get French to fight against the English, to say, oh, that's them over there. You know, we need a wall just to remind people, those are Mexicans, they're not us, they're someone else. And you know, who in their right mind, or who benefits? from getting people to think of other people as the other side, right? It's the people who want to, want to control us or rob us. You know, it's just, it's bizarre. I mean, and you know, you can't, I, I can't go into the, the, the nation state, you know, the, the nation state is being obsolesced. It is, and that's, what, that's where we're watching. People are realizing, oh my gosh, it was really not real. It was really not real. Our memory is like it doesn't really jive with this. Not, I'm. It doesn't make sense, right? And that's that's scary. So that's why we got to build walls around them to like, no, 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 they're real, you know. But I mean, gosh, I mean, the, the, we were not ready for globalism. We just weren't ready for it, you know. If you look at the, I would watch the World Cup every year when I was in high school and college, and they got fights. Crazy fights in these things. Are these people ready for a European Union if they can't even sit in a freaking <laughs> soccer game? You know? So I feel like it was a, you know, and some sense that was the television that did it, and, some, and the other sense it was neoliberalism. And now we're all just so convoluted. I mean, I was at the WTO protests in Seattle. Is anyone else there? A lot of what Trump is trying to do is what we were asking for at the WTO protests at, at, at that point. And a lot of what we're doing, calling them communists or reds or Russia bait, that's what they were saying about us. So it's a really interesting little um, reversal that's happened. Um, I read the book, so, and I want to dive into something you haven't really talked about here, but um, try and bring it out. You talk about the 80% that's predictable by the algorithms, and that the 20% that isn't is where all the creativity and everything else comes from. Um, my wife and I started a nonprofit that's uh, Square Peg Ranch, and we work with kids on the autism spectrum and horses. And one of the things we say is it's square pegs, everyone fits. Because everybody sometimes feels like they're a square peg in some context or another. And I think also in some context or another, everybody has the possibility of being of that part of that 20%. So can you expand on that idea of the 80-20 and, and, and that whole thing a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I was kind of riffing on the Pareto principle, I guess it's called, the 80-20 principle. And what, what, what some of the uh, uh, psychologists at Facebook and other uh, social media manipulation companies found out was that you can use somebody's past 
to find out with about 80% accuracy what they're going to do in the future. So, you know, Facebook can look at your past behaviors and find and put you in a bucket that has about 80% statistical accuracy of that you're going to go on a diet in the next month, that you're going to find out that you're gay in the next month, that you're going to get divorced, that you're going to try to get um, uh, uh, fertility drugs or whatever it might be. They know that 80% accuracy, but there's this 20% that doesn't do that thing. So they fill your news feed and they use algorithms to start, if it's like for the diet, you'll start getting messages, hey, you look kind of fat, or oh, what's in your blood, or look at the liver of a man who didn't do whatever for 40 years. You know, you'll start getting these messages sent to you by the algorithms, not just to get you the part of the, not just to get you if you're part of the 80% to buy particular products, but to get you if you're part of the anomalous 20% to conform to your statistical profile, because they want to get their accuracy up from 80% to 90%. And they don't do that just by doing better data research. They do it also through manipulation of you after the fact to get you to behave true to your alg algorithmically predicted statistical profile. So what are we actually doing with our algorithms? We are sending them out there. We're teaching them to find our exploits and manipulate us to iron out, to file down whatever might have been unique or different about us in that moment. So we are literally ironing out the humanity and trying to, we're, we're using technology to get human beings to behave more automatically and predictably. And the reason we're doing that is because the way is betting on the future. But they don't look at digital technology as wild new possibilities for a human possible, you know, for a human future, they look at these technologies as something that's very important to figure out, hire the right scenario planner, go to the global business network, whoever it is, you know, the evil futurists, and get them to tell you what's going to happen so you can bet it, bet on it with your money. But the, the algorithms that are doing this, that are actually trying to zombify us, to get us to behave as statistical features rather than as humans, these are, these are the modern equivalent of demons. That's what demons are. They use your exploits to manipulate you into doing stuff that's actually against your own best interests, that actually alienates you from who you are. And that's, and that's eerie to me. But the part that bothers me most is that if we lose that 20% of uh, and all of us are in different 20% at different times, right? You're all, everyone's got that, is, is, is in the 20, you might not be a 20% person who makes YouTube videos, but you are the one who writes something on Medium, or you are the one who does this, or who makes craft beer, or whatever, wherever you are. If we iron out those 20%, we are reducing the possibility of people coming up with novel solutions to our collective problems. If you want a cure for cancer, if you want a cure for plastic in the ocean, you want to be increasing those 20% weirdness. You want, to, you want to add to that. What you want to do is create a society that's so resilient it could accept not just 20, but 30% weirdness or 40% weirdness. You want to get that, the weirdness quotient up, not down. But that, so that's, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm particularly disturbed by, by how we're using these uh, uh, technologies. You know, the... the on the, the real internet of things, we are the things. No, we really are. Go back to Korzybski, plants bind the sun. Animals bind uh, 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 place, space. Humans bind time. You know, by binding, it's like, like you know, they can, uh, a plant can take the energy from the sun and bind it into matter. An animal can move around so we can get its energy from space. Humans can bind time because we don't have to experience everything. I can teach you something faster than you could go have to learn it yourself. But the algorithms, they're binding us. They're binding humanity. And that's sketchy. You know, they share. They, they're all talking to each other. They find an exploit in Bill. And I was like, oh, try this on your human. You try it on your human. Oh, yeah, it's working. It's working. Okay, everybody, try this on humans. Yeah, it's it's like the it's like anti solidarity. It's like on steroids. Yeah, you know. <clears throat> so.
So <clears throat> I have an important question because I'm, I've been a high school teacher for 25 years. And at first I'd like to thank you because 18 years ago next month when I saw Merchants of Cool, I'm like, oh my God, because I teach economics. So I've been using all of your stuff for the last 20 years. So thank you for the curriculum. Uh, but because the students I teach now are digital natives, everything that you talk about in this book, I, I got it two days ago, I read it on Saturday. And when I talk to them about it, and I even brought it up in class today, they're like, so? Because we know what it was like in the past from a digital standpoint, they don't. So why should they care? I mean, in some sense, they don't have to care, right? The, a book is me convincing people who are trapped in a hopeless utilitarian society that there's still hope for us to reclaim the dignity of being human. Your high school kids haven't yet totally lost the dignity of being human. Right, it's still there. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily bother, unless there's a, a, a particularly, particularly relevant moment to share with them in there. Yeah. But there is a so, isn't there? I mean, I, I, it's interesting. I, I played um, Generation Like, that last one, for um, college freshmen. And even they were like, well, yeah, yeah, so what? So what? Um, in some cases, I feel like the college students, well, I teach college in the city. I teach, you know, city, city university. And I don't feel like those kids are trapped in this simulacra that we're talking about because the kids that I teach, they're working in their parents' Chinese restaurant during the day, taking care of their kid at night or getting there. I mean, I'm helping them get their mom out of a homeless shelter into a better one. So they're so, um, and they're in Queens, New York. They're like in the mini globe. So I don't see quite that. And I think some of them are not as uh, vulnerable to these devices. I mean, in some sense, the fact that they're saying so um, gives me a little bit of hope. If they were like, um, yeah, but don't, don't tell me that because I want to be the next Tyler Oakley and I want to get a billion likes and I'm still going to make it in this thing, then I might be, uh, we got to talk. Um, but are they, or are they just kind of uh, uh, a near to it? Yeah. It's all 2013s, ancient by modern standards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some of them didn't, uh, uh, some of them were wise enough to look at that girl who, know, who whose mother finds out if she shows her boobies that the girl gets more likes, you know, and a lot of them go, oh, I mean, because they're, they're smarter than that at this point. Thanks for teaching. Yeah. 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 Where do you teach? Uh, I'm wondering if you can, I, I'm wondering if you can maybe talk a little bit about a kind of paradox that I'm trying to get the edges of here, which is that um, you talk about how um, we want to retrieve these values from the medieval period, and some of that has to do, I think, with uh, depending on each other and collectivity. Um, but you also described that there's this, this limit to how far out we can expand that horizon and really still kind of grok it. Um, at the same time, it seems to me like uh, some of the more profound problems that we're rushing towards the cliff edge of, like namely compounding wealth inequality on a global scale and the climate crisis, those seem to be addressable mostly in a very large scale that is maybe exactly beyond our horizon to crack. So how do we deal with these, these two things in tension with each other that on one hand, we're best when we're dealing with, with groups that we can know each person. And on the other hand, there seem to be these issues that are too large for groups of that size to resolve. Um, I mean, we could talk about it in terms of dimension of time or dimension of scale. And you end up with the same sort of conundrum. So it's like, here I am telling people to take a breath before you act. 
we don't have time to take a breath. There's only 60 years of topsoil left. Right? So that on a time scale, it seems counterintuitive for me to say take a breath when there's such temporal urgency. On the other hand, I'm saying, look, keep it real, keep it local, keep it eye contact. The climate itself, the atmosphere enveloping the planet is at risk. You connecting with Joe in Madison, Wisconsin lovingly is not going to do that. So I see that. But, but the, way, the way that I, I contend with that seeming paradox is that human beings, human beings act on a local, personal, scaled level. Human beings can gather into larger institutions that take on sort of bigger, uh, bigger problems, but I'm, I have more faith in the replication of local strategies across great distances than I do in the construction of global entities that solve wicked problems. You know, there's, I know, I mean, and, and, and I feel for that, and, and I see the logic. I've talked to a bunch of people who like have designs for eco villages, and they're usually it's like former game designer who now has an idea. This is going to now fix the climate, or fix architecture, or fix that, and we just got to blow up the bubbles or flatten this thing and build my vision of this thing. And I've got the plan, and I can do you know nine thousand of them around the planet, and then grow plankton on the water, and then put phosphine in the air, and iron filings in the ocean, and bing, bang, boom. And there's yeah, but there's a, I also just feel that there's a um, that there is yet time for us to adopt more uh, 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 what do they call biomimetic, a little more a little more biomimicry. You know, and think about it a little bit more coral reef-like than um, industrial, uh, industrial scaled uh, solutioning. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Adam Brown. Yeah, Adam Brown. <laughs> or, um, oh, that one works. So there's, there's, but at least first, even if we're going to create uh, uh, sort of UNESCO size goals, we, we just, even if we just take a week off to do this, we kind of have to touch ground, you know, and recalibrate. You know, and we just might be making the same problems in the appropriate ways if we're not calibrated. And that just, that's as easy as making eye contact with a loved one. You know, just, you know, take an exhale. And, and, and there's multiple missions going on at once. So I'm on a propaganda mission now to try to convince people that human beings are worth keeping around, to start thinking about humans in terms of dignity rather than utility value, to start treating their children's potential dignified humans rather than uh, worrying about them having a job. There's no jobs, don't worry. Um, you know, it's having a job in the future. So sort of reorienting people towards what matters and what doesn't so that we can, we can uh, uh, retrieve basic coherence and then vote effectively, legislate, um, work with our, I mean, and the, the structures are there. God, when you listen to the Fred, uh, the Fred Turner episode of, 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 of Team Human, go to the local zone board meeting, go to the board of ed meeting, all of these boring, horrible, local, civic institutions, they're already there. You know, and the only people who go are a few old people and, and crazy people. So if we show up and actually, you know, do the hard, boring work of, I mean, this is bad boy, of, of, of reclaiming our civic reality, you know, I do think, I, mean, I still like the word scale, but I do think that it, it, it spreads. I think it, can, I think it can be replicated. I think people will see it all over the place. If what people were, were writing about on Medium was not their design solution for the new UX of the blah blah, but what happened at their, what, what they tried at their board of ed meeting to um, get their kids off uh, uh, common core curriculum, you know, it's just a nice, uh, 
I think that, that, that can work. You know, and, and if it doesn't, at least we'll have made the world better on the way down. You know, but, <laughs> you know I mean? but, but I think that there's, there's so many different people who can do so many different things. You know, and you're right, I don't have, I don't have the answer, but I have some answers, right, on how to at least get people into a state of readiness to approach some of what you're talking about. And we're not even, we're not even ready. If we're in a place now where the kids who are going to Stanford who could come up with these solutions are pivoting to, you know what, um, then we, we, then we got to go a little further back in the, in the, in the process. Yeah, just, I, I just wanted to add quick, quickly to Doug's comment there and, your, and address your question is, is uh, um, yeah, replication is the, the team human way to scale solutions or uh, scale out solutions. And, and uh, there's a 2009 uh, paper by Eleanor Ostrom who won the Nobel Prize uh, in economics for her study of commons and really debunked the, uh, the you know, Garrett Hardin narrative, uh, the, the tragedy of the commons that, you know, actually human beings can't work together and uh, share resources and manage resources over long periods of time even. And, and um, you know, in this 2009 paper, she, she, uh, she puts forward the idea that, that uh, the, maybe the best way to uh, approach climate change is through this decentralized, uh, uh, you know, method where local solutions aggregate to a, glo a, a faster global solution. And I think we already see the makings of this with cities taking the lead uh, in climate change and, and other areas where, where the, 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 you know, nation states and international bodies are kind of stalled, right? And, you know, the, the, the media plays a role in this is in that all the attention is on national international politics and none on local politics at all. Our attention is distracted away from where our, 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 uh, where we have the most control, right? Right, and just your time. I mean, how much time do you need to spend to convince yourself that Trump is not a friend of climate change? How many articles do we need to read? How many tweets do we need to make? And that's time that you could be spending. Right, if, if, if diversity is one of the great problems of the, of the biosphere right now, of the, of the environment, then why not thousands of different diverse solutions as a way of, of restoring? some planetary diversity rather than, you know, uh, the one size fits all, uh, you know, plankton clone. Yeah, I'm glad you came over here too. It's more, yeah. it's more human. Yeah. <laughs> well, I like what you were saying. When I don't, I'll move back over there. Okay. <laughs> I love the way you started off. This is working good. I love the way you started off with this sort of caricature of a tiny subset of the people who don't really know what it's like to be human. You know, the laugh together, breathe, sing together, move, dance, you know, bullshit, whatever, but not necessarily understanding, you know, the information infrastructure of the optimal tree layered edge network or something like that. Um, that second part, though, is what I spent most of my life doing. So I know very deeply that there are people who are in love with math and who ground their decisions and their careers more in mathematical principles than on some of these untrustworthy woo-woo feelings that we're not quite sure we got right. I mean, I got A's in math. I didn't get A's in emotional communication. So I know why I went where I went. There's the opportunity because everything you were saying is mathematical. You're talking about incentive structures, information protocols, expectations, economic arrangements. Everything in Team Human is essentially a mathematical truth and those people will understand it. You find somebody at Goldman Sachs and Uberquant who lives and dies by thermodynamics, get him to read your book to the end, he'll have to change the world. He's already committed to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and, that's, and Aristotle understood math too. I mean, this is a different kind of math. Speaking of math, uh, I used to teach math at MIT and I left to pursue a career in applying cognitive science to make human situations better. And uh, KK and I now try and create better situations for people to really grow and unlock their potential in Zambia and Laos and, and, um, and here in the Bay Area. And we've kind of been seeing something really interesting to us, which is that when a human, so 
I want to draw an analogy. When, if you think about like the simulation of social life that is Facebook, which is really turning social interactions into this low-grade dopamine kind of addiction, um, then you could think of like the thrill of discovery coming after the depths of despair of trying to do something and finding out that everything that you thought would work didn't um, as the kind of real human thing that leads to growth being uh, replaced by the kind of simulation of standardized tests and uh, gamification in education and we're just seeing how deeply we can go into this kind of human um, existence of people trying to conquer their fears and this kind of threat to their ego and identity and then come out the other side with some discovery that builds them up and makes them greater. So for us, actually just trying to make people more skilled at things, better at things, or I mean, social things as well as you know, problem solving things, um, has led us to kind of confront these kind of very essential parts of humanity. And I wonder uh, whether you have kind of a picture around like skill and mastery and growth and that sort of thing yeah i mean i mean what it makes me think of is in is that in our society we treat what you're talking about it's what we call speculation you know it's a uh it's a bet not this journey, this discovery thing you're talking about. And that's always the big, that's, that's the, the, that's the real spiritual crisis of capitalism is that you, you, it's such a powerless feeling. If all you've got is money, the best you can do is try to bet on which number am I going to put it on? And that's, it's the equivalent of the feeling of going into the unknown and trying something new or I'm going to stack these things in this way and see, but it's not real speculation or it's not real, it's not real exploration. It's just speculation. And I, I feel like we don't distinguish between those things in this society, at least, you know, and, and that's why people will send their kids to the Rudolf Steiner School or Montessori or Harkness Learning or whatever other, or, or, or constructivist learning to, to see how that place, I mean, the thing that he's talking about is sort of what, what this, uh, a musician, Genesis Piorage, once told me, the only good trip is a bad trip, you know, and it's sort of that's, and in America, we even like to call it grit. Oh, it's grit. Do you have the grit to go through it? No, but it's what I was trying to say at the beginning, the David Lynch place. It's can you, let's just try this. You may fail and you're, or you're going you're gonna to fail. You're going to fail. And then they're not, what if the kid, you're telling them you're going to fail and they're, that's cool. And they're still going. How many of these can I stack up until it falls? I don't, I'm going to find out, you know, and it's that living place. But yeah, I mean, and I do see it. If you want to see positive um, positive blockchain use, look in Africa. You know, you want to see uh, people using cell phones and uh, smartphones in an empowered way, you know, look in India, look around. There's um, uh, other ways of using these technologies. And I feel like these are in, in some cultures where that uh, uh, the, the hacker ethic has, hasn't quite been quelled yet. up in the last point you were making because I, I up at all and back and it was like you know stranger in a strange land on big and huge and multiply and the community systems had disappeared. Um, you know, savings and loans when I was a kid, that's where all gone public and been corporatized. Capital in this country is really restricted. It's not free flowing. And so you talked about Africa, you know, a second China recently where people just, even beggars are waving cell phones at each other. But those are systems where 
this form of capital hasn't really reached them, right? The global banks aren't there. So my question really is, and maybe you've addressed it, where are these very community-based versions meaning as money, as a, as a medium of exchange where people can come together and work and share and not have to just feed the beast? And, um, and how do those models grow in a system where it is already so entrenched that capital is for capitalists? I mean, the, 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 for me, the positive side of the capitalism story is that corporate profit over corporate size has been going down for the last 75 or 80 years, meaning corporations are really good at taking all the money off the table, but getting increasingly worse at deploying the capital that they have. So what that means in some ways is that capital is getting worthless. They're laundering the money, whether you want to call it drug money or not. The, the high rises are going up in New York. So they're taking the capital and putting it higher and higher and higher up in these billion dollar floors of these buildings and the people don't have money um, to exchange. There's no, but there's nothing they can do with their capital. There's just so much has been printed. I feel like the capital is becoming the worthless thing. So, I mean, I feel like we're at the end of a cycle. I mean, I think we can go back and read our marks. I feel like it's going to, um, yeah. Well, the small examples are not where the capital is overflowing. The small examples are what you can read a list and share with every single week. Here's 10 examples of platform cooperatives that are working. Here's 10 examples of communities that have uh, uh, restored a local currency. Here's 10 examples. I mean, everywhere, that's why I read shareable. Healthy utilities. Oh, look what Brazil did. Look what they did here. Look what they're doing there. Look what they're trying here. Look, they use bus tokens or this. They, you know, and you just go, oh my God, thing after thing after thing after thing. I mean, you, you read something like shareable and you get filled with hope because you see that there are, I mean, capital-based solutions are going to end up being capitalist. You know, it's just, that's the way they go. But if we can move from this kind of growth-based economy to a flow-based economy where you're optimizing for the velocity of transactions and the velocity of currency rather than the extraction of capital and its conversion into share price, you start getting some interesting, interesting things. And where you see it happening are either communities where there's no money, so they have to learn to trade again, and they got to come up with their own poker chips to trade because they have skills, they have, you know, they have resources, some of them, and they have, uh, uh, they have needs, so they just begin trading. Like, oh, this is an economy. It's like a Dyson cyclone. Oh, it just happened. Um, you know, and, and once it starts growing enough, then sometimes capital comes because it wants to get involved. And then if they have a working economy, that's when they have to be clever and go, well, let's, you know, now if you're going to get in here, you're going to have to participate. Great. Thank you, Doug Rushkoff. Thank, Thank, so Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Children the talk tomorrow, Commonwealth Club. Tomorrow, tomorrow City Lights and Wednesday at Commonwealth.